Looking for the training and skills you need to get a new career? Call Center for Training and Careers today. That's CTC at 408-213-0961 and start building your new career today. Want to find out what's going on in your community? El Observador is San Jose's bilingual weekly newspaper. Go to your local newsstand and pick up your free copy today. I'm Siwapili Rose Amador, and this is Native Voice TV. Well, this evening we're going to learn about the Pascua Yaqui tribe, and I'd like to welcome Michelle Montañez. Yes. Is that correct? <laughs> Michelle Montañez. Leo Sentiana. That is a welcoming in Yaqui language. Oh, wonderful. Now, are you learning the language? Uh, slowly, there's um, actually somebody from East San Jose that has gone down to Tucson, Arizona, um, that has gone down to the Sonora, Mexico area, which is where our tribe is from. We have a sister tribe um, that's in Mexico, and the Tucson reservation is where the majority of the Pascua Yaquis reside. And he has been able to learn the language, um, has gone to school down in Arizona and is becoming a linguist and is going to be sharing that knowledge that he's been able to learn from the elders and everybody else that he has learned from and is now teaching me and other people um, that are willing to to learn the language. Oh that's wonderful you know um, Assemblyman Joe Cota is going to be coming on the show in the next few weeks and he just had a bill passed where if a native person does speak the language, they can start teaching it in the schools. Okay. So that's wonderful that uh, he is, you know, becoming certified and can teach the language and pass it on. So tell me, where's your family from? Um, my family uh, is from the San Jose area, mm -hmm. but um, my grandfather is from Tucson, Arizona. My great grandmother had brought him up in the Tucson area, and. Um, it was something there that if you were not able to uh, have the money that was necessary to survive, a lot of Yankees would actually migrate to California so that they could follow the um, produce or mm -hmm. the, crops. You know, the crops, right, mm -hmm. exactly, to be farmers, so, um, or really pickers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So that's how they ended up in uh, the San Jose area. Yes, exactly. Okay, we were talking earlier how, well, of course, before the borders were there, you know, a lot of these tribes were on both sides of the border, and you right. were saying that uh, they migrated from Sonora up to the um, Arizona area? That's correct. Um, if I can just go back a little bit mm -hmm. before that, um, the, the Yaqui people came from the Surem, and those Yaqui, uh, before it be, they were known as Yaquis, the Serem were very small people. They were called little people. And they uh, had a time where it was peaceful. They lived in harmony with nature and uh, themselves. There was no problems and life was good. But um, as time went on, things changed and um, there was a talking tree that came and started speaking. Nobody could understand what the tree was saying. And uh, all of the leaders, the elders, would come to this tree and try to find out what this tree was saying. 
And what happened was uh, a little girl was tugging on her dad's sleeve and saying, Dad, I know what it says, I know what it says. And he goes, you're being foolish. She goes, come on, Dad, let me tell, let me say. So he says, fine, you go in front of all of the town and you tell them what this tree is saying so that everybody can see your foolishness. And what happens is she sits in front of the tree and she starts explaining everything that the tree is saying. And the tree was God or the Creator speaking to us and telling us of the coming of uh, religion, Christianity, Catholicism, mm -hmm. uh, the Spaniards, uh, the devastation that was going to come with that. Uh, they told of the steel on the streets with a monster that rode over it, and that was the train. So this tree gave them the information that life was going to change. Mm -hmm. And the Sarem split in two. And they decided, half of them decided that they could not deal with the change. And they went underground and they became ants. So when we see ants, we don't kill them like most people do. Mm -hmm. We talk to them and you know, if we can, we give them a little something to eat because that's our family. Mm -hmm. And the other half, then became Yoem. The Yoem are Yaquis. Uh, when the Spaniards came, they came to um, the river, the Yaqui River, and we were asking them, can you speak? Which is Hiyaki. Oh. Speak is Hiyaki. So we were asking them, you know, do you speak? and they thought we were saying that our name was Yaki. So that was then translated into our name, but um, traditionally mm -hmm. our name is Yoen. Oh, okay. So um, we resided in the Sonora, Mexico area mm -hmm. for many years um, without any problems, and in about the 1500s, the Spaniards finally came and uh, the, the information that the talking tree had given that young girl was finally coming true, mm -hmm. and um, we fought. We w were very protective of our land, and the Spaniards tried to take it from us, the Mexican government tried mm -hmm. to take it from us, and what happened was is that um, we were able to band together. Um, we were able, within hours, to be able to have 7,000 people come and fight to be able to keep our land, to keep our water, um, to keep everything that we needed to survive. And after a certain time period, um, thousands of years, hundreds of years of fighting and you know, being tormented by whoever it is that came and, mm -hmm. and found our, our land uh, fruitful, uh, we as people had to make the decision to either leave or stay. Some people stayed. Um, those people, um, either they caught the smallpox and died. <laughs> um, very common. Right. Yeah. Um, or they were captured, used as slaves. They were sold um, to many different places. Um, and it, it was unfortunate that that occurred. But some of the people that were not captured as slaves they were free for a while and um, the government actually put out um, a call to the government to say capture Yaquis and then send them to imprisonment in the Yucatan and different areas. So some people um, were free for a while mm -hmm. and then got captured and then were um, prisoners. Um, there are stories of, of people who were prisoners who were sent to the Yucatan and they walked all the way back wow. to Tucson because they wanted their freedom that bad. And they're one of the tribes that fought the longest. They did. They are very strong warriors and the women are actually strong warriors also. They were able to fight alongside the men. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have a uh, very rich culture with um, defending our land, our culture, our people. So as time went on, um, a lot of the Yaquis would actually go 
to um, as far up as the Gila River mm -hmm. um, by Phoenix. Right. Um, and we would find places that had water that we could farm because that is our true selves. So we did spend a lot of time um, between Phoenix and Tucson. So now there are five different pueblos from Phoenix to Tucson that we have um, designated as traditional communities. Okay. And um, the reason that we say that they're traditional is because they now do ceremonies. Mm -hmm. So if you do traditional ceremonies, then that is a traditional um, pueblo that we call it, and um, the the main one that I usually go to is on the reservation, and um, that's that's the, my main focus. Of, that's the of reservation knowledge. in Tucson. Correct. Because there's one in Phoenix as well, right? The reservation um, in Phoenix. Those are the pueblos. Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. but the the main reservation is in Tucson. So um, we did not get recognized um, by the United States government until mm -hmm. 1978. Uh, which was kind of exciting. We had um, somebody from uh, the local government get involved um, with Anselmo Valencia, who spearheaded us getting recognized. And it took a lot of money, a lot of effort, and um, a lot of campaigning to get this done. And when he went, um, the congressman went to the uh, Washington to get us recognized, they said that we were not a tribe because we had not fought with them. <laughs> and so Anselmo heard this and he says, well, you want to fight? We'll you give you a battle. fight. <laughs> so he told all the Yaquis, most of them were in diapers. <laughs> okay, so the Yaquis, they get in their cars and they drive to a, a certain area that was um, very uh, busy, especially mm -hmm. for the white people who were coming home from work. Mm -hmm. And they blocked those roads with their cars and they stood out and, and you know, most of them were holding their kids, you uh -huh. know. And, uh, and so the congressman, uh, finally gets a hold of somebody who can get a hold of uh, Anselmo and tell him what is happening. So Anselmo calls the congressman. We're going to war, huh? <laughs> he says, he goes, what are you doing? I heard you're blocking all the streets. He goes, well, we're at war with the United States of America. And he goes, okay, it's over. And he goes, Our, and Anselmo says, okay, you won, okay? So now that we have gone to war with you and you have won, now can you recognize us as a tribe? Wow, so, that's, I had never heard that story. That's fascinating. Yeah, so September 18th is a very big day for the Yaquis. Wow, that's, yeah, I wasn't aware that it had been that recent, you know, that yeah. the, the tribe was recognized. Yeah. Let's take a pause, Michelle, then I want to hear about the ceremonies and everything else uh, that's going on over there. So we'll be right back. You want to find out what's going on in your community? El Observador is San Jose's bilingual weekly newspaper. Go to your local newsstand and pick up your free copy today. Well, we're talking to Michelle about the Pasco Yaqui tribe and um, learning a lot of things I didn't know before, Michelle. Thanks for <laughs> educating me. So now I know you're, the biggest ceremony is in Easter. Easter. Easter, right? Yes. And unlike some of the other ceremonies that are so public, the powwows and so forth, this is something that's very sacred, very closed and tell us a little bit about how that goes. Well, um, it, it's open to people that want to come, but um, traditionally it's a small community that, mm -hmm. that goes. And um, we have people that are in charge, um, maestros and capitans, mm -hmm. that are in charge of um, getting together all of the dance societies um, to be able to orchestrate this particular ceremony. Um, the, the people, the main people that um, kind of organize it are actually chosen in December or January. And so this is like an all year round thing that we prepare for. And it's 40 days and 40 nights. So um, the most, the busiest time is really the week of before Easter. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have ceremonies that last all day and all night. 
So um, the people that have dedicated themselves, um, they dedicate themselves in years of three. And the dedication is oh, usually, <laughs> uh, it's, well, it's years of three or their whole life. And uh, the reason that they do these dedications is because somebody in their family is sick or they need help. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's um, due to illness. And um, if somebody is very sick and uh, they have been gifted healing, they will dedicate themselves for life. I just spoke to somebody who uh, is close to my age and he made that dedication because they saved his sister. And um, so, well, what's the significance of the three? Because normally you hear four. Four, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, it's very hard for me because I'm Apache also, mm -hmm. and we do things in four, and then the Yaquis, they do things in three. Mm -hmm. And that's just how it is. Yeah, there's, um, it's very interesting because all tribes are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And um, when it comes to uh, fours, that's very common. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the Yaqui flag, um, there's, it's very symbolic. And with that, we have four stars on the side of each flag, mm -hmm. and that is representation north, south, east, and west. So we do recognize that, and we have that in common. But most of the time, everything's are in threes. Oh, how interesting. That has a cross in the middle, doesn't it? It does, and that cross is black. And that is to represent um, the people that have been lost through the years. Uh, the red is representative of the, the bloodshed that has been lost. And the white is in the middle, and that's for the purity that we all want to reach. Um, and then the blue, it's uh, in threes, and it's, it's in blue. And that is for the creator, sky. Mm -hmm. So oh, that's interesting. Now, the regalia, the dress you're wearing, the is something that's significant to your tribe. Can you tell us yes. about that? This is a Yankee um, traditional dress, and um, this shawl is also part of um, the Yankee dress. And this, I had to get permission from um, someone down in Tucson, Arizona, to be able to wear this dress. Um, the feathers, uh, excuse me, the feathers. I was looking at the feathers. <laughs> um, the, the flowers um, are representative of um, blessings. And we believe that certain things give us protection, and one of mm -hmm. them are flowers. Uh, another thing is uh, very bold colors, um, things that are shimmery. Um, uh, I wore abalone shell earrings because abalone, it distracts the spirits. There's too many colors in it, and it's very shiny, so uh, it protects us. Uh, we believe that the color red protects us, that we can wear it on ourselves and we don't have to show it and mm -hmm. it'll protect us. But also, if we wear it and we show it, it is telling everybody in the room that we are protected and they know it. Um, uh, there are certain times of the year, um, we, uh, each Pueblo has a different saint. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dia de San Juan, uh, is celebrated in June 24th. And if you were born on that day and your name is Juana or Juan, um, you have special powers. But if your name, you were so named something else, mm -hmm. you don't. And with that, those special powers will protect you from anything um, that somebody puts upon you. So we have um, that understanding that uh, there are people, um, I like to call them energy vampires, mm -hmm. but there are people that um, have uh, an ability to put a bad feeling upon you. Um, and we have something called an ojos. And that is the necklace that I wear, and it protects me, and it, it looks like it's a deer's eye. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end, there's red string, and that's our protection. And uh, that, that ojos is symbolic of the deer, and for us, the deer dancer is very important. That's what I was going to ask you yeah. about. Tell us about the deer dancer. Yeah. The deer dance. Yeah, the deer dancer is something that came before uh, the Christianity. And the Pascuala dancer 
he wears a mask on his face, and it only covers a portion of his face. Um, with that, there are symbols that are special that are on this mask, uh, the tears, the sun, and then there's usually an animal, and that's because we live in balance with everything. There is a life cycle. We believe in nature that brings us all together. And um, so the Pascuala, he also has very um, long white hairs because he is the elder. And he does blessing dance. Uh, when he dances, he's blessing the area. Once he has blessed the area, then the deer dancer can start dancing. And the deer dancer um, is usually, he has um, a, a, a shawl and it's around his waist. Mm -hmm. And he has um, uh, cocoons. They're um, like butterfly cocoons that are put on a string and then wrapped around his legs. Oh. And then he has rattles. Um, and the, the head of the deer is, uh, usually it has antlers. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the antlers, there's usually very bright handkerchiefs. And those handkerchiefs have embroidery on them for protection. And then he wears um, handkerchiefs here and then around his waist. Uh, he also has a belt that is made of um, deer hooves. And all of this is used in ceremonial ways for the noises, for the sounds, for uh, the relationship that we have with nature. Um, the reason that we started doing the deer dance is because we needed food and deer was plentiful in our area mm -hmm. and we respected nature. So we wanted to make sure that creator or God knew that we were going to be taking um, an animal down and this deer was sacred to us. So we wanted to honor it. So what happens um, before they kill a deer, they would dance all day, all night and tell God or the creator that this is something that we were going to do and we respect this animal mm -hmm. in all these ways. So when, um, if you're Yaki and you go down um, or if you're not Yaki and you go down and you watch these ceremonies, um, you can actually see how the head moves and the dancer um, either has to have a dream that they're going to be a deer dancer or this is something that an elder sees in them that they motion as if they were a deer and then they are chosen to become a deer dancer. It must be quite an honor in it, the tribe to be selected to be a deer dancer. Yes. Yes, yeah, so um, we actually, um, uh, we, <laughs> the California Yaki Association is um, a group of people in California, specifically in Fresno, that um, has a uh, association with the Pascua Yaki tribe. Mm -hmm. And um, the Pascua Yaki tribe will sponsor for a deer dancer and his singers uh, to come up and they then uh, show us what it is all about. You don't get a true feeling until you actually go to the mm -hmm. reservation, but it gives people that are in California the opportunity to see what a deer dancer is all about and listen to the music and understand what um, that feeling is. Because once you hear it, it's different. It's different than powwow music or anything right. like that. Uh, we use... Um, a tin um, basin and we put water in there and then we put a gourd and that's our drum. That's a water drum. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then we have um, ironwood raspers and so there's a specific sound that you hear and it's very representative of the deer dancer and um, the California Yaki Association is open to anybody of Yaki descent. Uh, you do not have to be a uh, somebody who's on the rolls or um, registered as a Yaki. Um, I am the California Yaki uh, representative for the Bay Area. So anybody that has any questions in regards to the Pascua Yaki tribe or the California Yaki Association, um, I'm open to, to assist them with any questions they may have.
That's good because we'll put your um, email on the screen because I have a lot of people, of course, in this area, you know, that are yaki and they want to know who, how can I find out more, how can I register, how, you know, what do I do? Yeah. And we'll put them in contact with you. So how often do they come or do they come to this area or may need a Fresno area to, uh, you know, provide this kind of education? Yeah, um, they have come to the San Jose area and that was about four years ago. And, um, but normally they come to Fresno once a year. And um, that is something that I don't miss because it's such a blessing that I don't have to take a plane flight mm -hmm. and you know get all that coordinated. So um, they also have some cultural information um, that they share. We have um, monthly meetings to discuss our culture mm -hmm. and um, the association itself. So they are trying to get a larger amount of Yaquis within the Bay Area to come together. So if they know that more, uh, there's gonna be more people in the Bay Area, they will send for the, um, the people and bring them up here. Right. So yeah, if, um, if you know of anybody, let me know because we want to get them up and, and share this with everybody. Oh, absolutely. Well, we'll have to make sure our audience uh, stays informed, lets us get, stays in contact with us so we can let you know, we can let the audience know that uh, this is available for, you know, for them to come out too. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank it's you been for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure, me. very educational. And thank you for being here and keep in contact with us. Keep in contact with Michelle if you'd like more information on the Pasqua Yaki tribe in the Bay Area here, because I know a lot of you are Yaki. So thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next Sunday. Good night. <laughs>